we have Melanie and Byron on, and we're going to send everybody to Melanie's link tree to find your contact okay. information, Melanie. You'll find that link in the show notes. But if you're familiar with Linktree, it is Melanie Sikma, and it's S I K M A. I should have asked you if I pronounced that right off the bat, Melanie. Did I get it? <laughs> right. <now. laughs> hey, great. I don't think I'm going to have as much problems with Byron's, but I wanted to. Yeah. I really. Yeah, I'm Byron's daughter, and I used to get called the McDust Pan in high school. <laughs> I don't know if I win my last room. <laughs> so my last name is Haas, and you can imagine with the name Jack Haas what kind of yeah. torment I went through. But I really appreciate both of your time here today. We're going to be talking about CPA, and you take a quite a bit different aspect regarding being a CPA taking that additional step in order to ask some questions and provide some feedback in order to save people money. And that's a big thing when it comes to real estate investors. Yeah. But Byron, were you the one that kicked this business off? I started my first CPA firm in 1985. This particular one I started in 19, 2001 or something like that. And then the focus really though, is to have to save people money because most CPAs we feel and they just ask questions to fill out the forms. They're so busy and overworked that they just want to get through the return and get it on to the next one. But we tend to take a lot of pride in asking the questions to save you money. Or it's a totally different philosophy, I think. One of the things that I think is really telling is that when I started real estate investing, I was trying to find those companies that I could create some sort of partnership. As far as I was mm -hmm. concerned, they were just, they were team members. And I was trying to find businesses to actually provide me some feedback, provide me a little direction. And this is actually pretty rare. It was hard for me to find somebody, especially in the CPA world, to actually give me advice or direction, if you will. Yeah, yeah. they're incredibly yeah. hard working, but they're just focused on the task at hand. Yeah. What were you going to say, Melanie? I was going to say that the average person I talked to that saves about $38,000 on their taxes, and that's just with our low-hanging strategies. So right there, that tells you pretty much any person that I talk to, we can save them money. And that tells you just how hard it is to find a CPA that's proactive. Yeah. Wow. 38000 on the low-hanging opportunities. Yeah. What, what are some of those opportunities that you typically target that most would miss? Yeah. So one thing that my dad did a great job at is he systematized tax planning. And so we've put that into a seven-step okay. process. So we talk about putting your kids on the payroll. If you have kids under 18, you can pay them 12950 tax-free. So my my five and my seven-year-old, they're my little models for my business. And I use post their pictures on Instagram to teach things. And uh, we talk about doing the Augusta strategy, where you can write your house to your business for 14 days tax-free. A lot of our clients, we just have them hold their corporate board meetings in their home. My dad funnels some of his income to his mom's lower tax bracket, so my grandma's tax bracket. And saved him what last year? You saved about forty thousand dollars doing that, Dad. I saved me forty one, but then I paid eleven on my mom's return, so I saved a net thirty thousand dollars. Okay. Me to go into detail on that one, or yeah, if you're willing to share it, some of these yeah. some of these things are strategies that, frankly, I haven't heard before. I should say I've heard of the kids under eighteen aspect, but what you're doing there with your mom sounds interesting. Yeah. Now, one of the things on the kids on the payroll, you have to make sure that the kids are doing reasonable work for reasonable pay. Mm -hmm. So if you have a five-year-old, you can't pay them to file papers or to, it's got to be, it, it, the, here's the test. You're an auditor. I look you in the eye and I tell you what they're doing for the pay without smiling. Okay. Because that way it's, it's for real. But the beautiful thing about using the kids as a model is that they just have to stand there and take pictures. And, and most people like to do business, people that are familiar with them or they're, are more similar to them. And so if you show that you're a family person and your kids are involved in your business, it makes you more know, the more of the note and trust. So not only do you use it legitimately in your advertising, but you can also develop some real benefit from it. Now, I got to say on that one, back to that is you really do, a lot of people will write the checks and they never want to do the post. So you have to actually put pictures of the kids in on the internet for that way. You know, I had one person got audited, the IRS agent asked to see the pictures and the guy could only show him one grainy picture that was, cause he was doing it with his grandkids. Oh, sure. But back to 
the strategy about my mom, I help support my mom anyway. Okay. They're just, on, she was just on social security, her and my dad were. And so I started helping them out anyway. And my mom said that she brought this up that I had to make take her as a dependent on the tax term. The bells and whistles went off for me. So basically what I do is I formed a separate entity. It provides a service. My mom owns it. It provides a service to my CPA firm, say social media or something like that. And then I have it last year. I had it make a profit of 84,000. I had that tax to my, since my mom owns it and she's just the passive owner of the business, that 84,000 got taxed at her rate. She only has social security and a small pension. So the tax on that was only $11,000. Okay. But me, I'm in California. So we have all the sunshine tax and everything. So my tax bracket was 49%. So I saved on that 84,000, I saved 41,000 and I paid 11 on my mom's. Now I give her money anyway. So she takes it out of the business. We pay the taxes out of the business. And then what I do is she just gives me back the rest of the money. So she's allowed to gift plus or minus 15,000 a year back to me. So she just gives me back the extra money above and beyond that. And the beautiful thing about this is you take a parent that's on social security and a small pension. I give her $1,500 a month and that changes her life. But, and the great thing is I get the credit for it, but really the money's coming from the IRS. And it, my mom. We do that with people with like kids in college as well. And we call it the, if you have a baby mom or a baby daddy, we can have a baby mom or a baby daddy plan. <laughs> you do the oh, same thing. Okay. Sure. Or the in, indigent brother-in-law plan. You've probably seen quite a bit of different situations now, especially in real estate investing. What are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen so far when it comes to people moving to your, to your services and people probably just missing out on certain opportunities? We pretty much, we have a, like we mentioned earlier, we have a, what's called a seven step tax strategy where we go through and look for certain things that we consider are low lying fruit. And it's funny because people will take these questions and ask them of their accountant and they'll say, oh, you can do that. Yeah, you can do that. But the whole thing is they ask the accountant, well, why didn't you ever tell me about this stuff? People just don't, they don't take the time to get a proactive CPA. Melody, tell, Melody always talks about the second opinion. Why don't you talk about that a little bit, Melody? Oh, yeah. So if you get a can cancer diagnosis or if you're doing a big, my, my husband and I are actually remodeling our house right now. So you get quotes from a lot of contractors and you're always getting second opinions on those things, but nobody gets a second opinion on their taxes. I wanted to go back to your mistake, though, and this is not at all tax relating, but it's something that I think is important. I'm sure you've talked about it before. Uh, I last year, my husband and I, we bought a house from a friend and they told us this this story that really broke my heart for them is they had about 12 properties and that was pretty much the bulk of their retirement. They got into an accident with somebody and it wasn't even their fault, but for some somehow they were able to get sued. All of their properties, they got that taken away. And so their whole retirement was taken away. So just make sure if you have properties to make sure that they are secured, protected, an LLC, or if you have umbrella insurance or both, that's just really important. Yeah. We, I've had uh, Garrett Sutton on the, on my podcast and Garrett really goes into detail on how to protect those assets. And maybe I'll even link to that episode in the show notes because it's so important to have the proper business structure and corporate and incorporated structure around your properties. I always yeah. I tell people they should have it as simple as just giving an umbrella policy. Be surprised how many people don't have an umbrella. I remember when Melanie was a youngster and just started driving. I wasn't the driver. Who wasn't the best driver? And so she she just gets her license. She takes the car and she's going over. She goes takes this freeway off ramp and. Somebody's coming the other way and Melody thinks they have a stop sign. If they don't, so she pulls out and teeth runs them and almost shoves them off the overpass. So she calls me and I show up and this, I'm sitting there and the gal that she hits walking around. And as soon as the firefighters show up, she lays down and starts doing the chicken, twitching and around. Mm -hmm. around it. And I had a full umbrella policy, so I just wasn't even worried about it because, you know, just making sure you're properly insured and properly set up. So at least you have a smoke screen in front of your assets. Mm -hmm. It's a really good thing to do. That's 
it goes back to step number one of our seven step process is pick the right entity. So making sure you're not only protected, but also that you're getting the best tax situation with whatever entity setup you have going on. That's a good segue because I was going to ask you, what are some of the questions that we should be asking as investors or entrepreneurs to make sure that we have the proper CPA in on our team? We actually have a six point list for that. that. Remembering it right now. We're, we're working on a book right now. So we created a checklist because one of the things we talk about, we we're talking about the different dangers that entrepreneurs go through or exposed to. One of them is CPA and they write agent. I'm an insurance agent. And so we mean, we wrote out a checklist. But what they can do is reach out to me with my link tree and then I'll shoot over those checklists. But no. I'd say just making sure you have a CPA that's asking you the right questions. It shouldn't be on you to ask questions. It should be your CPA asking questions on not how they're going to fill out the form, but how they're going to save you money. So we created, my dad was a big part of that, is we created a big checklist that all of our CPAs use on our team during the end of the year tax planning season. And they'll just basically run through that, making sure we're scratching and clawing for any deduction that we need to, as long as we're not messing up any borrowing needs as well. So I'd say, one, make sure your CPA is doing end of the year tax planning. They're not um, tax planning with, they're not running your numbers at the end of the year, and you don't know exactly what you're going to owe before December 31st, then I'd say that's not the best CPA for you. Anything to add to that, Dan? Yeah, I was going to say, make sure that they ask. Make sure that they ask questions on, when they ask questions, uh, just ascertain, are they questions to fill out the forms? Or are they questions probing on how to save you money? And it's hard for people to know that aren't knowledgeable on that, but it, you just really look, try to get to ask the CPA, show me some ways I can save some money. And if they just say, have you funded your IRA or buy a new car? You got the wrong person. Cause that's what most people say. Oh, buy a car or fund an IRA and then. They're just not being very creative with the process. And then we always say, sorry, I was just going to say, make sure they're aware of your borrowing needs as an investor, making sure that they know what AGI you need to stay at so that they're not over tax planning too. Yeah. I had somebody that we were pretty good at getting people's income tax down. And one of my clients who did a lot of flipping, we got him down really low. So he didn't have to pay any tax. He was super happy, but for the next two years. He had to explain to his, he had a hard time borrowing to do flipper deals. So you always want to make sure that you, when you, usually when we come up with a tax plan for people, we have them take it to the banker and say, is my AGI going to be high enough that I don't miss out on a hundred thousand dollar deal because I save $30,000 in taxes. Make sure that's not the case. That's a real critical deal. This reminds me what you're saying there is you're almost in this balancing act. We buy houses in our market on a pretty regular basis to the point where we've impacted some neighborhoods comps because we'll buy properties at a discount. And then when we have the appraiser or somebody go in there and then they look at the houses around what we're just finishing up, they go buy how some of those comps that are generated from our discounted purchases. So it's like this balancing act. We can't spend too much time in certain neighborhoods and you got to, you know, so it sounds like it's similar when it comes to your tax savings. The buying or paying taxes will give you buying power. So it's, unless you have creative financing strategies where that doesn't matter, then that's definitely something to, like you said, it's a balancing act. And we briefly talked about picking the right entity. And just to let people know for real estate, if you're buying and holding the best entities in LLC, and if you're flipping the best entities in S corporation. Okay. And the reason on that is because the flipping entity, the flipping income is subject is ordinary income. You don't get capital gains on it. And then you also have to pay self-employment tax on it. So if you're doing just a few houses on the side, let's say you have a day job making $70,000 a year and you flip and you make. $80,000 $80,000 on a property, you'll have to pay 15, you'll have to pay your regular income tax at normal rates, but you'll also have to pay 15% self-employment tax on that. So in theory, you could get up to almost a 37% federal, 15% self-employment tax. And if you're in California, a nine or 10% on that, you could get up to a 60% tax rate. 
just by being the wrong entity where you can mm -hmm. save that 15% by making sure it was in the right entity. So yeah. LLCs for buy and hold and S corporations for flipping. You mentioned California a couple of times. You got your CPA firm there. I haven't run into a lot of real estate investors that are actually in California, unless they're doing some sort of multifamily or unique type investing structures. Have you been able to help some investors in your market through tax savings and other planning to make some of those numbers actually work for their and invest in their own backyard? Yeah. Let me tell you a story about one of my clients. Okay. This guy was a contractor and he was really rocking and rolling. He was making about 5 million bucks. This is about in 2010. He was 5 million revenues and he was netting about 2 million. So he's really having just an incredible year. Actually, it was a net of 2 million. It was a little more than five on the revenues. But the, and actually, I'm saying it's wrong. He was netting 5 million. His tax was going to be 2 million. So what we did is we have a deferral plan we call kick the can. And it allows you to push your income into a future period. And what he did, he pushed that first year, he pushed a million seven hundred. We left his income tax to be 250. We deferred one million seven hundred and one million seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the future. And then he invested that into real estate. Over the course of the next five years with this deferral plan, we got him up to deferring the tax on 15 million bucks and he invested that all into real estate. Now, can you imagine having that much cash to be able to invest starting in 2010 and putting in real estate, how much money you'd have made on that? That's what he did with that plan. Yeah, so, that's interesting. Uh, and the, is that, is when you kick the can, if you will, does, is that completely defer a lot of the tax obligations? Yeah, it defers the tax obligations to the future. Now, I want to make it very clear. You still, at some point in time, got to pick the can up. Mm -hmm. So you still owe the tax. It's just, you're using the government's money tax-free. It's like an interest loan from the government, the way that we like to sure. talk about it. But the guy, I've had a couple of clients, particularly real estate investors, they get the half million dollars from the IRS in taxes, and they've invested and put it in some real estate syndications and made 20% on their money. If you do that five years in a row, then when you cash it out, you can take the money, pay back the IRS, and you get the investment profits for free. Hmm. That's the best way to use your money. Yeah, that's interesting. I, that's a new strategy, too. I've heard something similar where you could use it like a trust structure to essentially do what you're suggesting, but not in the, I think this must be a different approach. I think what you're talking about, it's sometimes referred to as a deferred sales trust. We call it a, an extended escrow trust. And what you do with that is you, when you're going to sell a piece of property, or let's say you want to buy a piece of property, but the people don't want to sell it to you because of capital gains tax. That's a fairly yeah. common occurrence, right? Yeah. So what you do is you form a trust. You sell it to the, you sell the property to the trust on the installment sale, and then the trust sells the property on the open market. So it's the trust has a, a buy and a sell price that are pretty close to each other. There's no taxable gain. And you only pay tax on the money as the trust makes a principal payment down on the loan to you. So if let's say you're buying a piece of property from an elderly couple and the only income they have is social security. If the cool thing about the capital gains tax is that you make less than $80,000, there's zero tax on capital gains. So what you could do is you could use this extended sales trust ex to extend an escrow trust to sell it to that on the installment sale, have the principal payments from the trust to the seller be the amount to keep their capital gains under 80,000 bucks. And then at $80,000, they pay zero tax. So instead of paying a big capital gains tax on the sale, by structuring this properly with the right person, obviously, you could almost have zero capital gains tax to pay on a sale of a piece of property. We call that our hangover pills. That's one of, that's one of our four hangover pills that, that yeah. cure the pain of pain. <laughs> yeah, you have names for everything. We do. So, as CPAs then, do you pretty much just help businesses in California or do you go across the country? We're all over the nation, yeah. Yeah, we're in 28 states, actually. Okay. We like the states like Texas that have no no state taxes. And Florida, those are the easy ones. Yeah. In well, but we're more meaningful in states like California that people that are hurting. Yeah. Yeah, our services are more valuable in California. Yeah. And just to remind everybody, check out Melanie's link tree, and I'm going to make sure to have this in the show notes 
So swipe over on your podcasting act. I'll make sure it's clickable so they can find you right away, Melanie. For sure. So when you have a new co- new person come to you to help with their taxes and being the, become their CPA, let's say somebody's mm-hmm. listening right now and they're going to go to their CPA here today and say, I need you to look in, into this. What is one tactic or strategy that everybody should be taking advantage of right now today that would have a huge impact on their tax obligation? I think looking at the lower tax brackets around you, that's the stuff that really saves a lot. Dad, what do you think? They're all good. The process we do is if somebody calls in, we ask and we have 20, 25 questions. We ask them, it takes about two minutes. And, uh, and by doing that, it highlights the different opportunities with internet. So come on, By- Byron, darn 25 questions doesn't take two minutes. Okay. Well, let, me, I think. <laughs> let me just give you an example. Do you have kids? Yes. Okay. How old are they? 14 and 16. Okay. So just right there with that, we would talk about putting the kids on the payroll if it's viable within your business. And that for well, I have my son comes with me every weekend, actually. Okay. Painting okay. And, and vacuuming and whatever I need him to do. But yeah, that's right. Awesome. Those little two questions can generate for you a $26,000 tax deduction. Yeah. Okay. So then we'll ask, are your parents still around? Do you help support them? Are they in a lower tax bracket? Are you married? Are you single? Is there a significant other in your year? But it's just those kind of questions. We sure. just have properly structured it to draw out the opportunities. And these aren't all the opportunities. They're just the, what we call the low-lying fruit. And, and, and One thing that people need to make sure that they're doing is Keeping a good set of books. It's not sexy at all. It's not fun, but it's really important because you can't do any type of tax planning if you're not properly tracking your numbers. So that would be the one strategy that could apply to anybody. Track your numbers, making sure you're having a good set of books. If you can't do it, find somebody that can and check those regularly. Yeah. Do you find, uh, is there any tools that you use or you've found that is helpful, especially in real estate investing, that might help some of these one-man bands to have better books we outside use, of an yeah, Excel like, spreadsheet? <laughs> we use QuickBooks yeah. online. The nice thing about that, because as, as long as you have a, here's what I'd recommend, have a dedicated bank account and a dedicated credit card. And everything that is remotely associated with your real estate business, put through that. Because in QuickBooks, you can import all those transactions and you'll either call them personal, you call them business, but at least you're going to have a conversation with your accountant on if they're deductible or not. If you're running them through your personal account, it's all mixed in with everything like that. And it's too easy to hide it. But if you have a dedicated credit card, dedicated bank account, all you have to do is just concentrate on doing that. And then we use a program like Dex. It's called Dex. It used to be Receipt Bank or Expensify. And just as you're spending the money, take pictures of the receipts. You know, write on there what the receipt's for, take a picture of it. And that way you have all your receipts. And that way at the end of the year, you have everything. Yeah. And that those two things there will get you all the deductions that you're really legally entitled to if you're properly done. And the receipts things can actually be really easy. One of the things that I use is Microsoft Lens. If you're familiar with that application, you can get it on Android or iOS. And it'll actually see the edge of the receipt and turn it into a very small PDF and save it to your OneDrive. Okay. It's easy to access and it's like quick, quick and painless. That's called um, yeah. Office. The quick, yeah. The QuickBooks Online app does that too. It's super simple and it just yeah. pulls it to your account. And then if you or whoever's doing your vote, they could find those and tie it to the transaction. So that if you were to ever get audited, you just click on the transaction, the receipt's right there with it. Makes it nice and easy. So. Are you familiar with an online application called Stessa? No. Oh, okay. I was just curious from a CPA standpoint, how something like that is. It's AI driven and you can tie your bank account into it. And then it starts to organize exactly the way you're mentioning. And once it starts to learn like Home Depot is a purchase associated with repairs and it starts to do all the categorization for you. Okay. I've started using something like that, but I have yet to get any, I haven't sent this to the CPA yet to see if this is actually beneficial or not. <laughs> one, one of the things no. that nice about QuickBooks is you have to do what's called a bank reconciliation. 
Oh, sure. And the, what the bank reconciliation does is it basically forces you to enter everything that went to your bank account in the quit. And that way you get every deduction. Because when you're using the Excel spreadsheet, if you have a thousand dollar invoice, you forget to write it down. You potentially have just thrown away $500. Yeah. Just from not writing it down. There's nothing to force you to get every deduction possible. And that's one of the things that's intriguing about some of these online tools is because it actually pulls in every transaction that's going through your bank. And then if it doesn't know what to do with it, it'll annoy you until you categorize it. Yeah. The so, only thing you'd have to do with that, an app like that, is a check. Something is deductible when you pay for it. So if right. I write a check to you and it doesn't clear for five days, and it's, if I write a check exactly. on December 31st, so you'd really have to go through and make sure that the checks you wrote at the end of the year, maybe for tax planning, are deductible because they might not have cleared the bank. And those things yeah. get entered in when they clear the bank. Yeah, not that's a very good point. Over. Yeah, yeah, that's a very so good point. So you just have to be real careful on the front and back. Yeah. But, you know, a good tax tip for, it's a little one, but it's fun, is on everybody mm -hmm. always makes their mortgage payment on the first of the month. Normally, right? On December 31st, you want to make all your mortgage payments on, on, on the last day of the month because interest is deductible when you pay it, not when it accrues. Because a mortgage accrues the interest, then you pay it. It accrues mm -hmm. the interest when you pay it. So the first time you do this, you can get 13 months worth of interest. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Sure. So for somebody that's got six or seven or 10 rental properties and they pay out $50,000 in mortgages on the first day of the month, by paying that a day early, you might generate a $40,000 tax deduction. So that this has been a great, absolutely great conversation. And you can tell I've already, we could keep going and going here, Melanie and Byron. One last time, I want to point everybody to Melanie's link tree. And I'm going to make sure to have that in the show notes, but look for Melanie Sigma. And you're on Instagram as well, Melanie. Yeah, I try to yep. do pretty regular post tax tips, just little tips and pointers for people. So you might want to look there too, because I believe she has her link tree there as well. But as we were closing some things out, I'm hoping we can do some rapid fire. We'll do a trade off and see what your guys' thoughts on a couple of things. All right. Okay. So here's a chance to bust a real estate investing myth. You're a CPA. What do you want to bust? Some misbelief that when it comes to real estate investing or Small business entrepreneurship. Oh. That will like that one away. The pressure on me. The, for, and this is more in relation to small business, but the, it, 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 this is more of a mistake I would, I've made in the past is I had all my eggs in one basket. Years ago, I had a, a heart attack. This, so if anybody's watching, I had a tree fall on me. This is not a fashion <laughs> statement. And, uh, and <laughs> Mel Melanie's link tree fell on him. Yeah, Melanie's link tree yeah, fell on him. But if you have all your eggs in your, in one basket, you can really like with me, I would have had my CPA firm just go bye-bye if I had died, if I had went away, but if I'd have just been disabled, I'd have never gotten anything because my business would have gone away and I wouldn't have gotten any life insurance. So just making sure you're adequately insured for both your business. It's not a myth, but I'm failing on that question. I apologize. Well, no, yeah, that's really, again, to go with that in my, my business will be my sole retirement. Yeah, that, like, that, take care. that, no, that, yeah. that is a good myth. And you know, really, it, that, that question it. came from when I was growing up, all of the late night programming around how to get rich quick. And you always yeah. did it with no money down in real estate. So that's where that question came. The no money down in real estate, that's written by Robert Allen. And we've actually hired him to help us write our book. So he's a phenomenal oh, okay. resource. Yeah. You have a book coming out very soon, right? We've just been, yeah, we have a little Draft one. It's got a beautiful front page cover on it there. Huh? Yeah. Was, oh, so now you held it up, Byron. Everybody's going to be trying to hit that QR code. This QR Our code. Rough draft. QR code. So <laughs> we have to send you the new QR code we just got. So, well, since we're on books, what book would you recommend everybody checking out or what are you reading right now? I'm reading the right. House. Go ahead, Dad. How to Structure Your Offers by Hormozy. Is that what it's called? To, oh, Million Dollar Offer. Million dollar offer. That's the one I'm reading right now. Oh, okay. Or listening to. Listen to it while I work in my garden with my neck brace on. Oh, yeah. Audiobooks is a big favorite mm -hmm. for me, too. Yeah. I'm reading Scaling Up again. It's my second time reading through it. It's how my dad's grown the CPA firm from five to 40 people in a few years. 
And I'm also listening to, I was looking it up right now, it's Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. It's a really good book. That's on Audible. Sure, oh, sure. Good book. No, I think I, I have both of those in my Audible library, and I have yet to listen to either of them. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit of a digital hoarder. I have so much <laughs> stuff. And then Amazon does a great job, like, going, hey, this one's on sale for $2. Are you interested? Oh, okay. <laughs> You just, they just keep we will actually, we'll actually send you a link to our little booklet we just finished. Once it gets back to the publishers, we have. A, oh, I'd love to check it out. PDF copy for you. So, what is the biggest business mistake you've made, and what did you learn from it? I think the biggest mistake I made is years ago I didn't start by figuring out what my core values were. Right now, we hire, fire, and discipline, and almost make all of our decisions based on what our core values are. And if I had started that earlier, it would have really avoided some either cancerous relationships or hire for my business as a CPA, hiring the wrong person can just cripple you and kill you. It's the same with almost any business, but living and breathing what your core values are and aligning with other people who have some similar core values. It's not a real sexy thing, but it really, it, and like Melody goes to the boardroom and they say, you have a personal vision for yourself and make sure that your business, your business vision aligns with your personal vision. Yeah. For me, I think it's the get, like goes alongside with the get rich quick and think that it's, everything's going to launch really quick, really fast. And so just realizing that anything successful takes time and effort and keeping that steady growth consistency. Yeah. So, well, how about a little fun? Which, how about your favorite movies? What you, what do you guys like watching? Oh, my favorite. I just watched Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> <laughs> Dumb and Dumber? Hey, classic. Yeah. At least the first one. <laughs> oh, I know. It's great. <laughs> My old favorite is called Quest for Fire. It's about uh, two a uh, couple of cavemen that their fire goes out. They have to go find fire. So they go on this quest to find fire, and they don't speak English. All they do is grunt. But you can understand everything they're saying with their grunts. And they go mm. through this process about finding fire and bringing it back to their village. That almost sounds like an old Mel Brooks movie or something. <laughs> it could have been. <laughs> so no, I haven't heard yeah. that one. He's a different duck, so he likes yeah. the different kind of movie. Yeah, we probably birds of a feather. I like some pretty odd ones as well, Byron. If you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would that be? It's probably the core values again, huh, Byron? I wish I would have learned the scaling up methodologies earlier and the traction. They're both the same thing. Sure. But I always, when my business went along at a certain level amount, and once I learned these methodologies, it allowed me to explode the business. Learning those, and it's really the biggest part of it is just the meeting and communication rhythms. It really has allowed me to grow the company and leverage other people's time. Where before, everything was just limited by my sheer willpower. Where now it's a system and follows the procedures. And anytime you have a problem, you figure out how do we change the system to make it better? Versus blaming people. Yeah, but that did really you, allowed my business to explode. Did you find that there was a little mindset shift there, being a one-man band for so long? And then I find it, it's for me, it's really tough to not seeing it as another cost, whether it's time or money versus investment, if that makes sense, in order to grow your business like that? The hardest part for me is managing 40 people is a lot more different than managing four. And when you're managing 40 people, you have to come up with an idea and you have to somehow make it everybody else's idea. So they have buy-in on it where when you're the king and you can just be a dictator and say, this is what we're going to do. It's very easy to move real rapidly, but when you have to make it other people's ideas and get buy-in, it's just a different dance you have to say or do to get the team to, because if you can get 40 people pushing in the same direction. It's incredibly powerful. Yeah. How about you, Melanie? Did you have something you'd give your younger self a piece of advice? Yeah. Luckily, I'm still fairly young, but I would probably want to just start sooner. I think I probably, uh, yeah, I don't use my college degree. I probably, and I got life experience in college, but I probably would have just started then instead of just kicking the can, figuring things out. Yeah. That's the number one response I get on this show is when I ask that question is starting sooner. It, it seems yeah. to be a pretty, everybody's singing that same song. This has been great. Is there a question or concept either of you wished we would have covered here today? The, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. 
I say we hit on most of the major kind of tax ideas we have, but the, I thought we did pretty good. I'm happy. I was just on David Meltzer's Instagram live this morning. I don't know if you, you know who he is, but he does these lives. And one thing he said that I actually wanted to leave you guys with, I thought it was really powerful, was be kind to your future self. So I liked that. But not only be kind to your present self, but how can you be kind to your future self? That's setting yourself up well, taking care of your health, all that stuff. I think is, I know that was a good thing to leave you. No, that, that is a great thing to leave us. It, and I really appreciate your time. And this was really insightful. I appreciate, appreciate you on this and the value you brought to the show here today. Again, I'm going to make sure to have Melanie's link tree in the show notes. So take advantage of that and maybe he'll even hit them up on that booklet when they have that published. Again, Melanie, sure. Byron, this was great. I appreciate your time and hope you'll come back again sometime. We'd love, love to have Thanks you. Thanks for helping.